Okay, cool. We're going to get started in three, two, one. Welcome everybody. We are so thrilled to have you here with us today for this incredible conversation. It's been a countdown moment to have all of our panelists and our moderator here with us today. So first, thank you for taking so much time out of your beautiful and likely very busy lives to pause and elevate and listen to a conversation that we know is going to be worth it. And we have thousands of people joining us today. So we're gonna let everybody trickle in and get comfortable, grab your water, grab your notepad, just get cozy because this is gonna be an amazing ride together. For those of you who aren't familiar with Farmer's Footprint, I just wanted to share a little bit about the context in which we are hosting this conversation. My name is Jesse Gardner. I work the incredible team at Farmers Footprint, and our mission is to unite, inspire, and empower this movement toward regenerative food systems as a means to restore human and planetary health. So there's really no questions as to why a conversation like this makes so much sense in this moment when we're all so connected to this food system and really wanting to work together collectively toward solution. So I'm welcoming you officially to this event, Context and Convergence in Open Dialogue on the Intersection of Glyphosate, Human and Planetary Health. And I wanna just lay the foundation for this conversation. And it's really something that we find a pillar of our work in that we really value dialogue over consensus and had this opportunity to have a conversation that isn't just an approach on anti-glyphosate, that it's actually an opportunity to allow for the nuance, to allow for the different lived experiences and the context that this chemical has had on our food system and all the different perspectives around that. So we hope you come here not with assumptions, but with an open mind and curiosity to explore a much more broad perspective on this topic and experience the solutions that we're going to present that come from all different areas of policy and land stewardship and human health to really make your own decisions and choices of where this resonates with you and where there might be actions that you can take. I want to just touch on a couple logistics as we do in this Zoom gathering space. Um, one of those that I wanted to share is just that we are recording every second of this session. So if you have to bow out early, no worries. We're going to get the replay out as soon as tomorrow. And you can share that out with all your friends and community as well that couldn't make it today. We also have our Q&A section that I wanted to just draw your attention to. You'll probably be aware that we don't have the chat function running. That's intentional so that we don't have a lot of distraction happening during the conversation. With thousands of people joining, it can um, disrupt conversation instead of be additive many times. But we don't want you sitting on any of those burning questions that you have. Please put them in the Q&A. There's the opportunity for you to upvote those questions. And we are going to be giving those to our moderator and really allowing that to be woven into the facilitation of this dialogue. So absolutely engage and throw your questions in that Q&A. And without further ado, I just wanna introduce you briefly to our panelists and our moderator of which we are so honored and grateful to have with us today. Um, we have US Senator Cory Booker, who sits on the Judiciary Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, the Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition and Forestry, and the Small Business Community Committee. He's been really inspiring and so passionate about these issues regarding pesticides in our food system, farm worker rights, and we are honored to have him here with us today. We've got Dr. Zach Bush, a physician and co-founder of Farmer's Footprint, an internationally recognized educator and thought leader on the microbiome as it relates to health, disease, and food systems. We've got Calla Rose Ostrander, who is a strategic advisor to individuals and organizations dedicated to the well-being of people and planet. She specializes in climate change and agricultural policy, science communications, and movement building. Then we've got Kelly Ryerson, also known as Glyphosate Girl, an environmental health writer, an ardent public health advocate and mother working at the intersection of pesticides, nutrition, and chronic disease. 
and Matt Nicoletti, who we're honored to have here, really representing the farmer perspective. He's a director of business development at Penny Newman Grain Company, an international grain and feed ingredient trading company headquartered in Fresno, California. And he's here to shine light on the weight of the decision and the complexities around what this chemical means within the lens of a land steward. And to lead this dynamic discussion, we have the honor of introducing Carrie Gillum, a veteran investigative journalist with more than 30 years of experience covering corporate news, including 17 years as a senior correspondent for Reuters, International News Service, and author of multiple books. And we are going to share all the ways that you can connect with our moderator and panelists. If you didn't catch all that, I know that was a mouthful, but we'll be sharing all the ways you can connect to the work that they are doing in the world. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get off the screen and I'll be back at the end um, and I'm going to hand it over to you Carrie for you to share how this work is intersected with your work as an investigative journalist and uh, really tee us off for this dialogue together. All right can you hear me now are we good? Great all right thanks thank you very much Jesse that was a very nice introduction uh, I appreciate being invited to be part of this panel uh, it is true, I have been a journalist for a really long time, more than 30 years. Um, the last 24 of those, since 1998, uh, my work is focused really on covering uh, the big business of food and agriculture. Um, in that role, you know, Monsanto um, was a key part of that, but I also uh, spent a lot of time covering uh, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, uh, Reuters basically moved me to Kansas in 1998 and said, we want you to look into um, this industrialization of our food system and agriculture and all the ramifications that that uh, has for trade purposes, for um, in nutrition, for the health of the environment, the health of people, and the health of corporations uh, like these publicly traded companies. So. Uh, I did visit Monsanto headquarters many times and, and spent time in Iowa with DuPont. I think I've literally been in hundreds of farm fields um, around the country from row crop farming, vegetable farmers, orchards, uh, ranchers, um, you know, really trying to understand from the ground up, uh, I guess pun intended, uh, the, the big business of agriculture. And what I learned um, and what prompted me to write my book, Whitewash, in 2017, and then a follow-up book, um, a couple of things. I mean, one is, first of all, very grateful for this organization um, because I farmers really are um, just such a fundamental part uh, of the fabric of our community, of our lives. They literally nourish our families uh, with you know, the production of their work. And what I also came to learn and really understand is that the modern system of agriculture, conventional agriculture, as we refer to it now, uh, has really become so pesticide dependent. And this pesticide dependence is creating this profound problem for our children and our future generations. Um, we're looking at you know, rising incidents of cancer and disease and reproductive problems and neurodevelopmental problems that we're seeing in our children. Uh, there's a whole array of not only human health problems, but problems for the environment. We're seeing a loss of biodiversity. We're seeing a loss of important insects and uh, birds and other species. They're important, uh, you know, not only for mankind, but for the world overall. We're seeing a loss of soil health. Uh, we're seeing a decline uh, uh, in, the, in the quality of our water. Um, and a lot of this is because of agricultural practices and pesticide dependence. So, you know, when you look at that and you put it all together, I see it really as a lack of accountability, uh, I think is a way to sum it up. You have a lack of uh, strong regulatory um, influence. You have regulators being very uh, cozy with a lot of the companies uh, that are putting these pesticides out into the market. You have a lack of accountability, certainly uh, from the corporate side, uh, and you have a lack of accountability from the consumer side. You know, co consumers who either aren't aware or are not engaged um, and are, are not active in trying to make their voices heard and trying to protect public health. So I think we all have a role. Um, glyphosate, sort of the subject of, of this uh, webinar, 
is what I call the poster child uh, for this big problem. There are a lot of pesticides, a lot of different um, problems that come with the different types of pesticides that are out there, but glyphosate as the most widely used herbicide in the world in all of history is ubiquitous. It's in our food, it's in our water, it's even found in rainfall, according to government researchers. Uh, the CDC recently reported that it was in 80% uh, of people in terms of urine samples. Um, so this affects all of us. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that we're here to talk about it today. I'm going to turn it over to people who are smarter than me on this subject. So uh, Zach Bush, if we can start with you um, from the human health perspective, let's talk about this intersection between soil health and human health and, and what pesticides uh, are doing to both. Very good. Thanks for having me here. The, over the last 10 years, my basic science laboratory here in Charlottesville, Virginia has been focused on understanding the role of herbicides and pesticides and the direct impact on human biology. And deeper than that, we launched the nonprofit Farmers Footprint to understand its impact, chemical industry at large, on soil systems. And the background that you just shared with the advent of the chronic disease epidemics uh, throughout the 1990s that really uh, you know, went into a hockey stick around the turn of the millennia around 2000. Uh, correlated with this incredible industrial revolution that happened in our ability to genetically modify crops to be able to handle direct uh, spraying of herbicides, which previously would have killed the crops and could only be used as spot spraying for weeds. Suddenly we were able to broadcast uh, these chemicals directly into our food system and use much higher uh, loads on a single field than ever had been imagined previous to 1996. And so we see this amazing correlation between the extraordinary explosion of chronic disease in the late 1990s, autoimmune disease, cancer, neurogenic disease, as you mentioned, all the way to this kind of death of topsoils and this acceleration of loss of topsoils is now affecting uh, farms to the tune of about uh, two tons of topsoil loss from every single acre in the United States, which equates to 11% of our GDP being lost in a natural resource that's critical to our future and, and food sovereignty and independence. So in studying that in our laboratory, we would demonstrate across seven species from, from mice and rodents all the way up uh, through dogs, cats, horses, cattle, chickens, uh, all the way to humans, that the herb herbicide glyphosate, which is the most common one globally, directly undermines the tight junctions, which are the Velcro that hold all of our cells together. And so you can imagine every single uh, barrier within the body, whether it be the gut barrier or the vascular barrier, the blood brain barrier, the kidney tubules, all these are held together with tight junctions and that Velcro acts as an intelligent gatekeeper or barrier to the outside world so that we're not inundated with toxins and inundated with nutrients that we can't handle with every meal or whether every breath we take. Glyphosate now becoming as ubiquitous as you described, we now see this uh, undermining tight junction uh, across the entire biologic system. And so we've been able to demonstrate that direct influence on human biology and animal biology at large and that has correlated with this fundamental loss of our regulatory system at the biologics phase so that we now go into basically an, an adversarial relationship to everything in our environment. So we see an explosion of food allergies in our children. We see an explosion of skin conditions. We see an explosion of gut and immune system dysfunction. We ultimately see pandemics that never occurred at the, at the size that we now see because we fundamentally undermined the very front line of our immune system, which is the gut and the vascular barriers that are made of these tight junctions. So we've introduced in you know, a massive quantity to the global community, these chemicals in the form of glyphosate and other herbicides that undermine this biologic system of regulation and longevity. And for that, we see this explosion of chronic disease. In launching farmers footprint, we found out that farmers are in much the same predicament as doctors today in which our education systems have forced us to become dependent on these chemical toolboxes. We don't know how to do our work as doctors or farmers without the dependence and use of these chemicals. Uh, we've forgotten about thousands of years of you know, traditional medicine. We've forgotten about thousands of years of traditional farming and it's understanding that we are part of nature rather than against nature. And so in our oppositional belief that we could produce more money, produce more food and being against nature, we really undermine biology globally in both human and planetary health. These chemicals have been patented as antibiotics, antifungals, and the like. And in the 1970s, that seemed like a good idea. We thought bacteria were bad for us, fungi were bad for us. We thought that a healthy, sterile body was a good thing. We thought that a sterile field could grow more corn. 
over the last 30 years, we've discovered that the microbiome, bacteria, fungi, and the like, whether in a soil system or in the human gut, is the literal foundation of health. And so we, by broadcasting now 4 billion pounds of glyphosate globally, have really begun to undermine the very biology of life on Earth. And we have seen the consequences. We've lost about 50% of life on Earth. We're cruising through the sixth extinction. Farmers are now estimating we only have 60 harvests left, given the rate at topsoil uh, loss and the fertility of that soil decreasing. We also estimate we only have about 80 to 100 years left of human life due to our rates of infertility and our rates of chronic disease as they go exponential with each uh, generation that comes. So we're at a crisis point and we're excited to see this panel come together because it's going to take every stakeholder across not just food systems, but across all industries that influence the agricultural sector, which includes energy. We grow an enormous amount of crops just for ethanol as an input to our fuel, and it includes our apparel industries. So lots of uh, our, our textiles are coming out of farmland, as well as, of course, plastics industry and the like. So this is going to take all the stakeholders, a global agreement that we need to reintegrate our belief system into nature rather than against nature and train our farmers and physicians to begin to understand life within the context of nature instead of against her. So thank you for that. That's a good introduction to, to the problems. When we talk about health ramifications from glyphosate exposure, um, there are, are a lot of scientists you know, who uh, have come out with published studies. Uh, there has been a real debate, however. Um, the International Agency for Research on Cancer in 2015 said glyphosate was a probable human carcinogen. They looked at epidemiology, toxicology, mechanistic studies. Uh, but the EPA and other regulatory agencies um, continue to assert that there is no real uh, link to cancer. Uh, there are many scientists who want to weigh in um, on, on this and other matters as they pertain to glyphosate. What is the settled science or what do you feel you have the most scientific weight on in terms of human impacts from exposure to glyphosate? I, I guess from a bias standpoint, I put most my most confidence in our laboratory experience that we've had every single day for the last 10 years, putting this stuff on cell systems. Every single cellular system you put our, this glyphosate herbicide on, you see the fundamental breakdown of tight junctions. And as soon as you isolate human cells, you see the advent of cancer phenotypes or, or cancer traits within those cells. So we've seen that across many, many species. It happens instantly. And at concentrations that, that are extremely commonly seen in things like our food and water systems now. And so I've seen it under my own eyes, which always helps your conviction when you see you know, cell systems dissolving before your eyes. And, and these have been published, uh, science, uh, myself, other uh, community activists and scientists have presented now three times to the EPA over 196 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles demonstrating the direct effects carcinogenic and otherwise to the human systems from these uh, chemicals. And you know, so far we, what we've heard from the EPA is there's not a mechanism for them to understand the evidence that we have at this human basic science level as a regulatory document. And so we have a gap between all of the science and our regulatory community's capacity to understand how to apply that. And frankly, I kind of understand that because the, the solution for our farmers is not to ban things. Our solution is to start to build an education and toolbox system, a landscape in which our farmers can be supported in their transition towards a non-chemical dependent uh, agricultural system, which is going to require change in our uh, crop insurance, change in the way in which capital comes to our farmers for their capital uh, expenditures on their inputs and outputs. And so we've got a lot of uh, you know cohesive cooperative effort that's going to be necessary to support our farmers in making the transition that many of them want to do, even those that aren't fully aware of the human impacts, they're all aware of the rapidly diminishing bottom line for farmers as they spend all of their money on, on chemical inputs and are seeing the loss of 6,000, 8,000 family farms a year in the United States due to bankruptcy or failure of secession because there just isn't the economic uh, sustainability that we used to see in farms because the cost of inputs, the chemical herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers has gotten so extreme. And so even if they don't understand uh, the human end context, the economics are real. We have, now have much of the EU, Germany being one of the biggest importers uh, in the world of grains, have now banned the import of U.S. grains, North American grains, because of the, the residues of glyphosate within our grains. They're buying all their grain from the Ukraine and Russia. And so you can see that there's global economic demands for our farmers to make this transition to a regenerative organic system. And we're going to have to cohesively see that this isn't just about food sustainability, for food independence as a nation. This is about economic viability of our entire farming sector. 
What about nutrition? What about the nutrient value that we're seeing in our crops and how glyphosate has impacted that? That was the beginning of my journey. I'd been uh, innovating chemotherapy with uh, food nutrients rather than poisons to find out that we could kill cancer cells uh, with nutrition rather than poison. And in that, I started a nutrition center in Charlottesville, Virginia to reverse chronic disease through high density food nu nutrition. And what we found is, is it was getting harder and harder to get enough food into people to get the adequate nu nutrients or medicine within the food to act as this, in this uh, effort towards stemming chronic disease. And as we drilled down into the plants and then ultimately in the soil, we found that glyphosate in particular was undermining the ability of bacteria, fungi, and the whole soil, living soil network to produce and deliver nutrients to the root systems of plants. And so we have not just dead dirt, we have uh, you know, severely nutrient de deficient plants that are not just deficient in things like calcium, manganese, selenium, and the like. They're also deficient in all those you know, plant medicines that uh, deliver things like you know, anti-cancer, antidepressants, anti anxiety, et cetera, that are normal in things like your fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, et cetera. And so we have undermined the biology of the microbiology within the soils, therefore undermining nutrition, therefore really making vulnerable the entire human population. Right. And as you, as you uh, make the plant more vulnerable to disease and, and pests, you, uh, some farmers tend to just pour on more pesticides. It's sort of like a vicious cycle, I think, right? We do the same thing as doctors, you know, disease yeah. gets worse, we pour on more antibiotics, more infections, we pour on more antibiotics. So it turns into a vicious cycle. When you, when you see yourself against biology and wake up every morning trying to figure out what to kill instead of which life to support, you find yourself in an adversarial, uh, really tight spiral uh, down, down the proverbial drain. <laughs> so Kelly, if we can move to Kelly, um, if we can stay on track. Thank you, Zach. Um, Kelly, you had a personal health crisis. Um, right, that got you involved yes. in all this and connected you here to become glyphosate girl. I remember meeting you for the first time. Which court, which trial was it? Which courtroom was it? The very first trial, Lee Johnson. Right. When, when I was new to all of this, I <laughs> it seems like a long time ago, four years ago now. Yeah. Uh, what we brought talked me about that, didn't we? I, you were glyphosate girl, I was glyphosate woman. But um, yeah, tell exactly. us more about your um, your experiences and how you got involved and why you're so devoted now to this this issue. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here talking because I know a lot of the people that are likely watching right now had um, similar health catastrophes to mine, which unfortunately are becoming increasingly common at a really frightening rate. I'm kind of the case study that of the type of people that Zach's talking about seeing um, in his clinic. I was in my 30s, had two children, um, was healthy except for some stomach issues, but like otherwise leading a normal life. And then over the course of a year, I had a large just onslaught of a bunch of different symptoms like rashes and major fatigue and pain and like weird tingling in my hands and my feet and digestive dis disorders. And, and it, it just seemed like it just kept on piling on. And so I went to see my doctor. And of course, they it was just a normal, conventional, mainstream doctor who um, ran a bunch of tests on me and I looked perfectly healthy. So in order to treat my symptoms, I was layered on with four different medications, um, all very strong. And those had their own side effects. And frankly, it was a complete nightmare. Uh, and when those medications didn't work for me, the doctors, as they often do, said it must be all in my head. And so I was like, I don't think that losing my eyesight is necessarily a symptom of depression and anxiety, but okay. So I, I, my dad actually drove me in a really weakened state down to um, a psychiatrist that my sister had found. And the psychiatrist had intake blood work that um, happened. To, it wasn't even an integrative psychiatrist, but he happened to have a vitamin panel on it. So he ran the vitamin panel and lo and behold, the results came back and my vitamin levels were absolutely abysmal. I had scurvy, I had beriberi, I had just these severe malnourishment diseases that you only see in like third world, like my doctors didn't even know what to say about it. So around that time, my sister was diagnosed with celiac disease and I thought, okay, here it is. I must have celiac. But unfortunately, because I was looking for an answer, unfortunately I did not. But my doctor said, why don't you try going gluten-free anyway? And that was when I started to heal. 
I went gluten-free and I started eating quite organically and these symptoms started to just disappear. And I tapered off of all these powerful medications that I was on. I, my, my son had crippling uh, ocular migraines. I put, made him gluten-free and organic. They went away. He came off of his medications. My daughter had digestive problems. She was organic and gluten-free and now is fantastic. So I started making these connections and my sister and I went to, um, Columbia has a fantastic celiac center. And we went to a conference in 2018. Um, and the doctors and scientists were standing and, and pontificating, why is there this sudden epidemic of gluten sensitivity and celiac? Like, what could it be? What could it be? And, and what could it be on the grain? And so something in the back of my mind, I remembered seeing a sprayer over grains. And so I went to the microphone and I said, don't they spray Roundup on the grains? And all of those scientists turned to me and they're, they're like, what? And doctors like, no, they don't spray pesticides on the grain. I was like, oh, okay. So I sat down not knowing. Then there was a scientist from General Mills who was present to sell his gluten-free Cheerios. And he pulled me over to the side and he said, yeah, we do spray, the, the farmers do spray Roundup on the grains. We know there's a problem and that it's gonna take people like us to put the pressure on the farmers to change their process, but it's gonna take two decades. I was like, two freaking decades, we're all gonna be dead. We're all gonna have problems <laughs> with gluten by then. So at the same time, the Monsanto trials were starting in the cancer trials are starting in San Francisco. Um, and so I popped in to just walked into the courthouse, sat there and decided I was going to blog under the name glyphosate girl and start talking about what was happening inside of that courtroom, because it was a freaking crash course on this chemical, everything about it from both sides being presented in front of me with these amazing experts talking and um, and so that's really what launched me into uh, doing what I do today. I dedicate most of my time to um, trying to free our food uh, and environment of glyphosate, but also some other um, quite terrifying toxicants. And what have your been been your experiences when you try to communicate this? I know you you've traveled around. You've been to D.C. I believe, right? You've tried to talk to people in power, positions of power on this. What kind of feedback and what what has your experience been with that? Well, it's it's been really odd because when I first started writing about it, it just seems so obvious to me that all of our food is sprayed with this. People, if they knew, they would be absolutely appalled. All I need to do is tell people, I'm going to write this blog. And what I'm going to do is go and try and fundraise off of it so I can fundraise the research that we need to do to, to prove that this is happening in the leaky gut connection. So I was very, very optimistic. Um, and what I didn't understand was that there is an enormous industrial machine behind a PR campaign to be sure people like me and like you, Carrie, and like you, Zach, and that we do not unveil what is actually going on here. And they use the defamation and threats and lies to tightly control this narrative about glyphosate because there's so much freaking money in it. Um, and they actually popularized this idea of calling people that criticize glyphosate or GMOs or ag agricultural chemicals, um, they call those people conspiracy theorists or, you know, misinformation, that's us. And it is ruthless. Like they are ruthless with it. They have paid academics. They have paid journalists to go in and they will start, I mean, Carrie knows better than anyone. I mean, they've had a heyday with her in her books. And so, you know, you, you can be just a small group of us that sort of found out this truth and you can say it as often as you want to. But if there are people out on social media that are waiting there to counteract whatever you're saying, then you start to think, OK, well, there's no way I can get this information out. Um, the other scary part of it is that the PR campaigns are really comprehensive that they put together and they were all unveiled in the Monsanto documents during um, the trials, which was very useful because it's not like we're just imagining it. Um, a lot of it parallels um, what they did with tobacco as well. And the scary part is, unlike tobacco, with glyphosate, you have no choice. You are going to be impacted by this chemical. At least with tobacco, you can pick, okay, I, I you know, I want to look cool smoking, so I'll take the risk. Um, with this, there's just no choice. And what's really interesting is that people watching this this webinar right now, you you might think, oh, I want to go and, and find out more about this chemical that Kelly and, and this panel were talking about. And so you'll go and you'll Google it. And you will come up with these really sophisticated, elaborate websites and articles that have been put out there and paid for by industry for people like you to come and see just how safe this is and how crazy we are, the types of people that would talk about this. And just as an example, I always just find really funny. Um, 
so they they have these front groups and the names that they pick for the front groups are really convincing, right? Like I would believe them over say glyphosate girl, but I kind of named myself glyphosate girls for the moment. I wasn't really thinking I'd probably still be talking about it. Um, so some of the names, Cornell Alliance for Science, um, American Council on Science and Health, Genetic Literacy Project, Sense About Science, and this is a weird one, the Independent Women's Forum. I mean, I don't know how that comes into play. Um, International Food and Information Council. So these are all things that you are going to Google, you're going to find, and you will find all the reasons why if we are not going to starve to death on this planet, we need to have agricultural chemicals and GMOs to feed the world. That's what you'll hear, feed the world. So I've spoken with a lot of um, preeminent scientists and, and some whistleblowers that have come to me, and I've, I've asked them, I said, can't you study the impact of Roundup on leaky gut? Can you show that this is happening? We need more published, published peer-reviewed research on this. And the scientists cannot study it because they are threatened. And this includes an extremely prominent um, physician who is like at the birth of functional medicine. And he said, I can't study it because Harvard... Um, won't let me continue to, to be a professor here. Like I won't be able to be in this hospital because that is how much industry is owning um, the science. And so it's just, it's very frustrating. Um, in terms of the government that you asked, when I first started writing, um, I was like, oh, holy crap, I am going to call up the EPA and I'm going to tell them what's going on here. They, they don't know. <laughs> I'm from a, um, I grew up in an Air Force family. I'm super America loving. Um, I, you know, there was no reason in my mind not to trust that they had our best interests. And, and so I, I was absolutely floored when I realized that to a certain extent, and I don't want to say this of all the people in our regulatory offices, because that is not fair. I know there's some really solid people there, but by and large, they are completely in cahoots with whatever the narrative is that big ag and conventional agriculture are, are feeding them. And they have to, they are stuck. They have no choice. They will lose their jobs. And whistleblowers have come to me and I would lose my job if I said, um, you know, that you shouldn't spray the orchards with glyphosate because it's going to give disease to the oranges. And wow, there's this epidemic. I wonder if it has to do with the roundup. You know, that is a scary position for them. Um, so, Let's see. So another thing that government does, um, Senator Booker, that maybe you should address. I don't know um, if you know about this, but seven point five million dollars uh, goes every has gone into this program called Feed the Mind. There's nothing uh, comparative, uh, comparable on the organic side, but it's um, the FDA and EPA and USDA have put together this educational program that that taxpayers pay for, um, and it's really cute. They're like dancing GMO corn. Um, and it's educating you as to why you should absolutely embrace biotechnology and GMOs and agricultural chemicals. And you can print out things and you can take them to your classroom and you can learn about how if we are going to feed the world, we need these poisons. And I just can't believe that I'm paying for that. I mean, I, oh my gosh, that drives me crazy. Well, let, let's do, let's <laughs> jump, jump over to Senator Booker. Thank you. I think we could have a whole webinar on sort of the misinformation campaign, the front groups and the money that goes to academics um, behind the scenes and, and all of that. So maybe we can circle back to that. But um, Senator Booker, thank you for joining us. Um, can you, uh, it, when I look at what you've done, you're sitting on the Senate Ag Committee and I look at all that you've done to try to um, address problems in our food system and our farming system. Um, you've, you've introduced several bills uh, trying to, to help both human and environmental health. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that work and you know what has drawn you into this and, and why you feel so strongly about trying to find solutions to these problems. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Carrie, for that introduction. Uh, I cannot tell you how blessed I feel to be here how urgent I feel this conversation is. Uh, when, when Zach Bush reached out to me, who was frankly a person that I have learned so much from, who's uh, informed me both on my personal health decisions that I've made, as well as uh, a lot of the work that we're doing, he's really helped to inform that. And is to me one of the leading voices in what I think has gotta be a, a revolution of sorts in terms of consciousness uh, in our country and realization of the problem. Sometimes I think we're like a frog in boiling water here in the United States of America, where our food systems are literally killing us uh, and we're just not aware of what's going on. And from chemicals to uh, the outrageous diet-related diseases, 
you talk about what taxpayer money is spent on, you know, only 2% of our ag subsidies go to the foods that are even government nutritionists tell us that we should eat the majority of fruits and vegetables. And so we are at a crisis right now and the explosion of diet related diseases and the explosion, as Zach pointed out, of a lot of these uh, uh, ailments uh, from, you know, the things that are disrupting our endocrine systems, the things that are uh, 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 associated with uh, uh, ca cancers, autism, you, you can go on. These are, we are at a real crisis point in America, not to mention uh, the global climate change and how so much of our agricultural and food systems are contributing to a major part of it. Not to mention uh, that we're experiencing a pandemic right now, but the WHO and others talk to the crisis we have that we could have, in fact, about 34,000 Americans die every year from antibiotic resistant uh, diseases uh, themselves because of our overuse of antibiotics. You can go through so many of the crises we're having right now. The question has got to be from, the, uh, from climate change to one out of every three government dollars right now being spent on health care. Why aren't we ta having this conversation in a grander scale? So that's why I moved to the Ag Committee because so many of the issues I care about, uh, economic justice, environmental justice, so many of the issues I, ca I care about uh, intersect within the Ag Committee. And so uh, to me, I feel this sense of urgency, but, but the surprise I have is really even down here in Washington, how many uh, folks just don't know about it or how powerful these lobbies are. And so my team and I are on a parallel track effort. One is trying to raise the imagination of people to understand the empathy and the understanding of people to understand what's going on. Uh, and that is a, a big effort. You know, Martin Luther King said it so well, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a common garment of destiny. Now, some people think that's just a, talking about people, but I think it's talking about all living things. And so one is just the awareness. And then two, as you said, uh, we're pushing a lot of bills to address a food system that is broken for everyone. It's broken for independent family farmers as we see their suicide rates three times higher than the rest of Americans losing their farms to these big multinational industrial agricultural efforts. Uh, it's, it's broken from a climate perspective, which I've mentioned. It's broken from a public health perspective, which I've mentioned. Our food system's broken for farm workers and food workers, who we, uh, many of whom we exploit horribly. Um, it's broken in, in ways that just don't reflect our collective values. And so my effort is to try to join with others, and we've got a coalition out there. I think Zach and others have been trying to pull this coalition together of farmers, of uh, 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 people who represent like the uh, farm workers, uh, like the United Farm, farm Workers, uh, climate people, uh, humane animal people, consumers, and more, uh, into trying to all band together to change this broken food system. So we are a nation, going specific to glyphosate, that uses over a billion pounds of pesticides, um, which is nearly a fifth of all the world's usage. Think about this. We are a little over 4% of the nations, of the global population, but we use uh, a fifth, nearly a fifth, 20% of all of the, of the uh, pesticides there is. And the EPA continues to register these uh, pesticides. They, they registered in just 2017, 2018, uh, about 100 pesticides containing green ingredients that are widely considered dangerous that are being used on our, on our foods. Uh, over 300 million pounds, 85 different pesticides uh, that are actually banned uh, in the European Union, and yet we are still using them here uh, uh, in the United States. And one pesticide regulation statute, uh, FIFRA, uh, contains these massive loopholes that put the interests of the pesticide industry well above the health and safety of the people in our country and the environment. And so uh, I've introduced a bill that would do really ban these dangerous pesticides that have been scientifically proven to harm people in the environment. And one of those pesticides our bill would ban is glyphosate. Um, and, and so another bill, though, I want you to talk about really quickly uh, is the Climate Stewardship Act. Um, it's not just enough to ban the toxic pesticides like glyphosate without helping farmers. Uh, farmers are critical to lead ourselves out of this crisis of a food system. And we need to start doing the things that don't incentivize them into the monocropping glyphosate using 
processes we see now. We need to incentivize farmers who often want to, they're great stewards of the land, to transfer, transition into more regenerative agricultural practices that's really going to help them to, to not only uh, uh, survive without pesticides, but really thrive uh, and help to lead the way out of a lot of these crises I've mentioned. And so the Climate uh, Stewardship Act would invest billions of dollars directly into voluntary USDA programs that already exist uh, that would help farmers and ranchers uh, and it would target those uh, 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 regenerative practices, uh, things that we all know that would work. And the last thing I'll say is, look, uh, and, and again, uh, a guy I've learned so much uh, uh, from, and Zach has said it already, um, we, we have, the glyphosate is not only bad because of its, 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 its threat to us, not only bad because of its threat to animals and pollinating insects, but it's also uh, bad just because of the soil crisis. We have, and, and this soil crisis uh, not only doesn't sequester the carbon we should, not only uh, uh, is it dangerous just for the future of farming, but it's also dangerous because it contributes uh, to flooding and other extreme weather events. Uh, and, and, and basically, we know this factually. So, uh, studies have shown that healthier soil can substantially reduce the chemical fertilizers, pesticides we use without reducing crop yields and can help for a lot of other uh, collateral benefits that we need to get that integrated system, that, that interwoven destiny that King talks about uh, to make it, uh, to make it uh, thrive. Uh, circling back just a moment um, to your efforts to uh, enact a ban on pesticides that are already banned in other countries, what, what is the status of, this has got a great name to it, right? Protect America's children from toxic pesticides. Uh, where is that? What is it? Talk a little bit more about it. And does it have a chance of getting through? Yeah, so everything has a chance. When we <laughs> first proposed uh, the, the Civil Rights Act, um, it, it was seemingly impossible to do. When we first opposed, uh, proposed marriage equality in our country, it seemed impossible to do. So everything is impossible until it's not. But one thing I'll be very clear, and this is why conversations like this are important, that as Frederick Douglass says, Power concedes nothing without a demand. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Um, change doesn't come from Washington. Uh, it comes to Washington. And until the American people become more aware of we, that we are literally allowing our families to be poisoned with chemicals we know uh, should not be used, then, then a bill like this is not going to move. But as soon as there becomes more and more activism around uh, legislation like this, then we're going to get things done. Now, we, my team has been successful. We started lobbying against another chemical called chlorpyrifos that was horrific. And what it was doing to farm workers was horrific. Other countries banned it. We kept doubling down on it. The Trump administration doubled down on it yet again. But as soon as Biden was elected, we knew we could hopefully work through the EPA and through that administration to finally ban chlorpyrifos. But that's just one chemical. Remember, uh, it's glyphosates and a numerous others that we know that Europe, Europe, the European Union has banned that need to be banned here. But one thing we need is much more awareness, much more activism, and much more engagement in, in saving our lives. Good points. All right. Well, I could ask you a lot more questions, but it's um, we need to stay on schedule. So if we can move to, to Matt, Matt Nicoletti. Matt, you've um, got a really interesting perspective um, from your role, uh, Director of Business Development at Penny Newman Grain, this big international grain feed ingredient company. You work with a lot of farmers. Uh, you're understanding all the ins and outs and the costs and benefits of moving, you know, helping farmers and seeing them try to move to more regenerative practices. Um, so if you could talk about that, like what are um, the risks and the benefits and how hard is it for these farmers who are trying to change, you know, the way that, that they farm? Um, as Senator Booker said, you know, we really need to look to how agriculture can uh, sequester carbon and uh, be a big factor in fighting climate change. Sure thing. Uh, and thank you, Carrie. And um, deeply grateful to the folks at Farmers Footprint, um, Dr. Zach Bush, for uh, hosting this event and this conversation. Um, incredibly honored uh, to be speaking with all of you and, and very much humbled to be speaking amongst, amongst such an illustrious group. So 
Um, uh, <clears throat> I think it would be really helpful for me to give a little bit broader context around our business and sort of where we fit into the agricultural landscape. Um, and then talk about our own sort of personal journey and in investing in regenerative agriculture and sort of transitioning our business to align with that because it sort of reflects a perspective, a cultural perspective and, and, and journey that I, I have come to believe will be reflective of what it will look like if we are successful and really trans and, and, and fostering this transition and ultimately, you know, reaching the hearts and minds of all of our farmers, which is at, at, at the end of the day, that is where this change is going to happen. You know, we're going, it's, it's going to need to be a ground level bootstrap movement. So um, just to give a little broader context around Penny Newman, uh, as Carrie mentioned, we're an international grain and feed ingredient company. We're one of the larger merchandisers of grain and feed ingredients in the Western United States. Uh, 144 year old business, been around a long time. We're headquartered in Fresno, California, second oldest company in Fresno. And we very much sort of transitioned along with the, evolved with the landscape of uh, agriculture in California, which some folks may or may not know it is the most agriculturally productive region in the entire world. The most diverse uh, agricultural production takes place here in California. Um, and uh, throughout the years in the, it was really the 20th century where our model evolved to grain merchandising and, and really all that was done at the local level, buying locally from farmers, blending and mixing feed mixes and selling to other livestock farmers. And then there was a crazy paradigm shift where um, California very much became a net deficit state on grain and feed ingredients as we started planting the specialty crops, the trees and fruits and fresh vegetables and things that we're known for here in the state of California. Um, and what we, the, what our company did to evolve along with that was we uh, supported the importation of the bulk grain and feed ingredients that um, very much remained in, well, the demand actually exploded in California amongst the livestock sector, still the largest dairy market in the entire world, very large beef market, very large poultry market, very large pet food manufacturing. So the grain and feed like ingredients that um, those different demand end users needed were required from uh, to be brought in from out of state. So that was sort of our transition that allowed us to grow to the scale that we're at today. Um, but throughout the years, again, we've worked directly with each one of these farmers in California, all these end users, we have a very robust logistics and distribution network. And it would, you know, coming from this community, it's very easy to get defensive of any sort of critiques with respect to the way in which we produce food. You know, I think that, you know, one of the primary points I want to get across to the audience today is that, you know, everyone is guilty of um, uh, cognitive dis dissonance, confirmation biases, right? I think Kelly really astutely pointed out like how effective um, some of the, uh, the, 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 the marketing engine, you know, how professional um, and sophisticated some of these efforts have been to devalidate some of the claims and crit criticisms against the industry um, that has really built the manner in which we produce food today. And I can, you know, claim to be a victim of that confirmation bias myself. When I came to work with Penny Newman, it was very easy to be dismissive of the uh, negative implications of GMOs, you know, the, the the feed the world phrase that Kelly alluded to, you know, it's it's very very easy to get sort of on a high, uh, you know, almost ethical pedestal with respect to um, you know this being the best way in which we can you know protect our society, um, but we we sort of got uh, lucky. It was serendipitous as far as how you know myself personally and the rest of our business was exposed to the benefits of a more regenerative paradigm. And it was just a, a brilliant agronomist came into our office one day through a mutual business relationship that had an idea for a soil amendment, a product that, you know, for us just represented diversification. There wasn't any sort of, you know, movement that we were already bought into or behind. It wasn't any sort of act of, yes, we need a, you know, uh, understanding that, you know, the, the system's broken and we need to fix it. It was, this was an economic incentive for us. It was business development, right? And so we gave this gentleman a very unsophisticated platform to manufacture this product and get it to the marketplace. And he's, it was just positive anecdotal feedback after positive anecdotal feedback. And the more we learned from this fellow and the more we got exposed to the regenerative agriculture movement um, and you know, learned about what his agronomic approach, his agronomic philosophies were, the more it resonated and validated the claims that were coming from the thought 
leaders and movement builders behind regenerative agriculture, folks like Zach and his team at Farmers Footprint, um, soil carbon, soil health, uh, improving water infiltration and sequestration. These are all really top of mind for growers. Um, it, you know, the fact that we use high salt fertilizers in the name of fertility, we're literally salting our ground out in the name of fertility. That's what the Romans used to do when they wanted to create, you know, they would conquer someone and they would want to make their society food unstable. They would salt their ground out. We literally do that in the name of fertility. And I should caveat that, you know, our primary perspective is more so on the fertility side of things, you know, glyphosate and pesticides, that's sort of the crop protection category, which we have purposely stayed away from, you know, our lens of the transition that we are fostering has more to do with um, making incremental changes in soil health structure and soil health over time. And we do that simple in very simple and approachable methods. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying with respect to, you know, <laughs> that in order to convince farmers, at least in our experience, you know, we're not talking about the, 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 the public health risks. We're not. We're, we're not talking about the, uh, the, the, the moral imperative of, of making these types of changes. We're talking about improving their bottom line in the short term and long term. You know, um, that's how you hook a farmer in year one. You know, if we, and, and, uh, and to over to again kind of simplify what we do, we t basically trade dollars for dollars in growers' fertilizer budgets and replace those high salt fertilizers with things that are lower salt, better for the soil biology. And then we bring in more natural biostimulant type of products that feed and propagate the biology. We, you know, we're not gonna get in, I think, to the geeky nuances of regenerative agriculture here today, but oftentimes regenerative gets conflated with the different management practices um, that help improve that soil structure. And those tend to be, again, like I said, management practices. But a part of that is, what are you putting on your soil, right? A big part of that is what are you putting on your soil? And we don't have to ask farmers to really change a management practice. We can sort of hook them and get them curious by coming in and replacing saying, hey, you do not need 250 pounds of nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen per acre to produce a 4,500 pound almond crop or excuse me, that'd be really high yield, but 3,500 pound almond crop. We, we can come in and we can use innovative testing methodologies to prove that that plant is getting the nutrients that it needs with vastly reduced rates of these uh, different like high salt fertilizers that um, are detrimental to, to, to soil health. So, you know, um, when I think about how we can really affect change um, and something I want, you know, this entire audience and the other, you know, thought leaders and movement builders to be aware of, it's that be careful with your framing and messaging around this. A lot of folks have been indoctrinated. They believe that what they're, you know, agriculture, being a farmer, there's a very strong cultural identity to that. And um, the criticisms oftentimes get dismissed due to confirmation, confirmation biases, which we are all, every human on this world is guilty of uh, uh, carrying confirmation biases and cognitive dissonance. You know, and I, I can claim personally, having gone through that transition, I was lucky to meet this agronomist that exposed the pitfalls of chemical fertility over a more natural bio, biological approach. So really all we've been doing as a company is fostering in these innovations, you know, using our distribution network, our sphere of influence, the fact that we're woven into the fabric of the production agriculture sector in California to be a driver of that change. And the way that we do that is simply by appealing to farmers bottom line. And it's the kind of thing where, you know, if we don't improve their their, their bottom line or, or prove ourselves in, we really only get one, one shot, one harvest cycle. If we can't prove that, you know, our alternative product can produce the same yield without compromising their, you know, without having them, it's different from organic, right? Where there's a three-year transitional process. The, it's assumed that your yields are going to plummet while your, co your cost of production is going to skyrocket. And you're doing so for the hope of some premium three years down the road. You know, people buy into the organic transition when they do transition to organic. Whereas all we're trying to do is get growers to take those incremental steps towards going regenerative without even knowing they're doing it. <laughs> That's probably the best approach, isn't it? Because <laughs> as you said, yeah, farmers are business people. You know, they're not running charities. They're, they're worried about their bottom line and uh, they need to feed their families like everybody else, right? Um, if we can move to Keller Rose, now, Calla Rose, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're so involved in this regenerative space and uh, you know, this compost production, climate beneficial um, material economies. Can you speak to your work? Tell the audience a little bit about what you're doing and why it's so important right now for us all. 
Sure. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you, Zach, for hosting today. It's really awesome to be here with you all. Thank you, Senator Booker, for your leadership. It's awesome to see it. Thank you. Um, I'm a political economist by training, which is a little bit of a lost art, but it's a, a discipline where we look at how government shapes economies, how economies shape this government and society, and how society, um, religion, and culture shape government and economies, and the interplay between all of these pieces and how they work together. Um, I'm currently working as a strategic advisor to the state of California in their natural and working lands climate strategy and how they really scale up climate smart agriculture and land management practices, as well as with private clients, <clears throat> everybody from cities and counties to individuals who are investors or philanthropists. There are a lot of folks who are very interested in supporting this movement. Um, I was really lucky to start off by working with a group that I'll just mention here briefly because of the relevance in the conversation, uh, the Rathman Family Foundation did something that was pretty unique in that they, they actually funded about $10 million in original science, which they did peer review publication around the effects of a compost amendment on uh, rangeland soils. That's not where they started. They actually started looking at grazing and they started looking at all these other climate practices. But through failure, they ended up finding that we have a mechanism to draw down and store carbon much more quickly in the soil than we thought. This was about 12 years ago, 13 years ago. But the fact that a family foundation spent that much money on original research in soil health, which is very underfunded um, and frankly, usually funded by industry, was really groundbreaking. And what it allowed us to do from a policy perspective was go in and present peer reviewed published evidence that then could be used to form a lot of what became the basis of California's soil health movement from a policy perspective. Um, and that movement was also supported by folks on the ground um, like Kiss the Ground and the food policy councils um, and farmers and nonprofits who worked in regions uh, community composters. So we had a really big grassroots movement behind um, what was really good science. And together, I think between the grassroots and the good science, we really launched, you know, in California, a very big movement towards regenerative agriculture. The human health aspect coming into play here and growing has, has really helped us expand the messaging in this movement. And I will just say that we did a bunch of polling a couple years ago and there is no Californian that doesn't want fewer chemicals in their food. Regardless of your political leanings, regardless of how you think of climate change, everybody agrees that there's too many chemicals in food and that they would like to have food that has less chemicals and that they would like to have it at a price that's less than organic. Whether real or not, organic is perceived as a price barrier. Sometimes we know that organic food is actually the same price as regular food, but there's a perception barrier. and so. What we found when we did all this polling was that the average Californian, you know, climate change was still a little controversial, but everybody wanted chemicals out of their food and everybody thought compost was a good thing across the board. It didn't matter. Those two things pulled super high. They also felt like plastics were out of hand. There was just too much single use plastic. That's another panel conversation. But these were the things we started to gather around an understanding how folks were really looking at this issue. And when it comes to compost in particular, soil amendments that Matt was talking about, I haven't really met a farmer who doesn't want a good soil product. You know, and, and because that soil product delivers so much to them in terms of yield, their bottom line, water retention, reduction in inputs, it's really been a pleasure to work on behalf of compost because uh, everybody loves it. And so I think that I've always led from this place of What's the thing that we can agree on that will get us in the door? What's that gateway drug that opens us up into this space? So I focus a lot of my work on helping um, material economies form around the composting of organic material waste and the reconnection to the agricultural system, food, fiber, and fuels, flora products. I will also just say as background, you know, it's great to have everybody here and really focused on a policy conversation because the agricultural sector in the United States is arguably the most socialized of all of our sectors. And I'll, and I'll wrap this up quickly, but what I mean by that is that the government and the people have said, it matters that we produce food and that we have food security. And so we're gonna have guaranteed bailouts to farmers in the form of crop insurance because farming is a really risky business. 
So the public is going to de-risk that business. And I say this in a good way in that we've invested and invest a substantial amount of money in de-risking that business so it can be supported by the private sector and financed by the private sector and that farmers can have businesses in this sector. And, you know, I'm glad that the, the health conditions have been brought up and the environmental conditions have been brought up, but I also just want to say that if you look at the goals that we set for this agricultural sector, which was to produce high volumes of cheap commodities, we have done a very good job at doing that as a culture and as a society. And so what I think that tells me is that we can change that system, that farm bill, and the many different bills that support and surround the farm bill to meet other goals, because we actually have been very effective at meeting the goals that we set in the 40s and the 50s for this system. And if our goals are for farmers to use less chemicals and our goals are for farmers to have healthier soils, we know that technical assistance is the single biggest indicator of market adoption. And we know that we need the government to back risky investments so the private sector can come in and finance transitions. Then we know what we need to do to do it. And I think what you've seen in the past 10 years is you've really seen an explosion of soil health and interest in soil health at the state level a lot of that really on purpose and a lot of on ground work has gone into building that. I personally didn't live in one place for more than two weeks for two years. And that was part of building that movement. And I think now we're at this place where the feds are in an incredible position to shift the way we do agriculture. And, and yes, it's about banning the worst chemicals, but really I look to these policies that are like, let's prove safety instead of having to prove harm. Let's make the baseline of operation of a soil health so everybody gets healthy soil and then build on markets from there. So I think we're really looking right now and poised to be in a systemic transition where we don't have to play whack-a-mole. I mean, there's that saying, and I'll end on it, that nature pours a vacuum, but really the petrochemical industry pours a vacuum. You ban one thing and they just put it somewhere else. So I think we're at this great place where we can really now transition more holistically to reset a baseline around soil health, which then helps us go after these really problematic issues like glyphosate, which are really harming our health and the health of the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, I want to follow up on that. Um, I, I just have to apologize. I have to get to the Senate floor to, to do a vote. I want to thank everybody for this conversation. My team is still listening in, uh, and I wish you all the best. Thank you for for for. Oh, I had a question for you. Darn it. I apologize. I apologize. They're screaming at me. Uh, <laughs> okay. so I'm going to run to the floor to vote. Uh, but thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. you very much. All right. All right. Well, Calla Rose, you get this question, which I was torn between you or Senator Booker. Um, you know, we hear you talk about the polling. Consumers clearly want fewer pesticides, uh, the pesticide free food, more nutritious food. Clearly, we care about the soil and the health of our environment. So you have that awareness, you have that um, that need, that desire uh, from consumers. Why is it so hard to make policy change? Why are we so stuck in uh, policies that are antiquated? You know, from a lot of experts will tell you, so antiquated and pushing. You know, all of the you know, and soy and cotton and wheat, and not really investing. There's a real dearth of of federal programs to support regenerative practices, to support organic um, agriculture? And, and how do we get to a place where we have a more receptive um, environment uh, in Washington, DC and in state houses around the country? So a really great question. And I'd, I'd be curious to hear your answer on it too, Carrie, because I bet you have some insights. <laughs> um, you know, I think one thing, and I, I don't mean to say this as a criticism, but I, I think where our imagination is sort of atrophied, I don't think we've done a large scale revamp of public policy like this in at least 50 years. And, and so I think we forget that that government really does set the parameters for economies and that you have to build them carefully. Like when we decided we were going to build fossil fuel industries as a primary economic engine in this country, or to build out agriculture and food security, we had very thoughtful people working on it for decades to really build in these economic indicators. You know, in agriculture, it's like, okay, we need more technical assistance, people training farmers. Well, that can be private sector, that can be public sector. Okay, we need more, we need more soil amendment supply. 
Where does that come from? We need more market development. We need more infrastructure for processing and manufacturing. You know, we need more people to be aware that their health isn't dependent on this. So these are, these are we, I think we kind of just think that sometimes like magically new economies happen because the tech sector has deceived us all into thinking this is the case, but they don't. They're built through strategic investments, through incentives, through disincentives, through programs, through research dollars, through education dollars. And when we align around those things, we actually have all the tools we need to build a new agricultural whose baseline is regenerative, where we don't have to have these chemical companies making these horrible products, but maybe they could help modernize organic. I mean, organic is years behind in terms of the tech and the multiple services that they provide. It's great to see you know, Matt's company on the call because they have a very sophisticated offering to farmers. There's not a lot of sophistication in the non-chemical like type of agronomic services out there. So we can build and transition economies when we are deliberate and when we understand that, you know, the farm bill happens every four to five years and it's going to take this farm bill and the next for us to restructure this economy. But if we can keep our attention, we know what we need to do. And I believe that we have the bipartisan support and certainly the grassroots support to do it. And why does it, this may be for you or you can toss it to someone else if you want, but why does it seem, and maybe this is just not a correct perception for me, that there's more attention and recognition and acceptance that we have a problem with soil health and an urgent need to address the health of our soil than there is from pesticides, than there is human health? Uh, well, you know, we've been really lucky that we haven't had a giant ad campaign focused against us for the decades. Um, and, you know, we did that pretty strategically. Um, the soil health movement, we stayed away from saying chemicals are bad and just focused on soil health is good. And I think we've come to a point where if you're not saying chemicals are bad, you know, you, you're hiding from something. But we didn't go straight at it as a target, you know, by investing and in developing the research strategically in rangelands and lower value crop systems, we avoided the attention of large industry. And we did that on purpose. So I think that there's now a lot of what, what will come is that the human health aspect of this comes into play and says, look, actually the chemical piece is really important and it's really important for human health. And I think that's where the soil health and the human health meet on the political front Obviously, they already are connected on the biological front, as as Dr. Bush said. Um, but I, you know, we've we've stayed away from targeting what's bad and creating direct adversaries, and stayed towards talking about what works and what's good, and helping farmers onto a platform that is less controversial. Um, and yes, I do a lot of work in climate change. I don't often talk about that. Um, I, I often start off with, you know, processes that are going to be helpful for them. And um, it's not to say that we know we're shying away from the truth of the health impacts of these chemicals, but to say, you know, when you start at a place where people are more willing to come, it's more friendly, you're not going after a big industry that's going to put a target on your back. It's an easier ball game to get rolling. And now the ball's rolling and now we can play ball. Yeah, I should have been writing about soil health all these 20 years, right? <laughs> Get the no, target I'm off you, my back. I'm glad you wrote about chemicals. Thank Get you. Get the target off my back. No, I recall, I recall um, back in, I don't even know, 2011, 2010, uh, this poor USDA ARS uh, scientist that uh, was finding all of these problems with soil health and he was tying it to glyphosate use. And I was writing a story about it. And, you know, he, it, the ramifications back on him. Uh, were huge and he was in fear for his job and you know more recently I heard from a USDA agronomist who was uh, teaching farmers about the benefits and encouraging them to use cover crops and going out through uh, the states but he told me you know I cannot say out loud that this is to help reduce the use of pesticides you know I can't tie those two together uh, when he pushed it because he would get in trouble so you know there are as you said um you know, you have to kind of uh, be delicate in, in how you how you approach this. I wonder, I don't know, should we, there's so many questions. I really wanted to get back if we could, maybe Kelly wants to address this or Zach or someone, um, this issue with misinformation, because I think, you know, this is, um, this is part of the reason why the lobbying groups and the corporations, uh, you know, continue 
to be so influential in Washington, D.C. and with consumers um, and why there is this debate still about pesticides in human health. So I don't know. Kelly, Zach, when do you want to address that? No? You can go ahead, Zach, if you want. Okay. Um, I, I, misinformation, I think, uh, it can also be just explained as special interests, you know, so that we have economic drivers in this country that have become uh, massive in scale. The, uh, the food and ag sector is about $1.8 trillion a year in the United States, which is about, you know, two, two and a half times the, the entire military budget of the United States. And so it is a gargantuan industry that is then again dwarfed by pharmaceutical and, and, you know, industrial medical complex. So you have an industrial medical complex that now is five times bigger than our military. A food industrial complex is twice as big as our military. And so one time in history, empires were driven by the size of their, their war machine. And that was what determined the worth of their fiat currency. Now we find our $17 trillion GDP dependent on these massive economies that scale beyond anybody's imagination uh, that are the drivers of, you know, keeping the U.S. dollar, you know, in this kind of palliative state that we have it right now. It's so vulnerable because of its uh, instability with the position that we're at with Fed, the amount of, you know, massive, uh, you know, 80, 90 trillion dollars of debt hidden under the surface of the United States go governance and our economic structures and all this. And so there's a lot of sense of desperation, I think, within this country at the high regulatory environment on down into, you know, the economic decisions being made at the Fed and beyond that is, has in that sense of scarcity and desperation to try to, to support the house of cards, sees these methodologies of getting information out to stabilize these industries that seem too big to fail, that ultimately are making the entire $17 trillion industry about to fail. And so it's just, it's one of these moments of human desperation where we make short-term decisions and we start driving, you know, kind of abusive bullying tactics because we feel this, this fight or flight fear at the societal level when you're looking at the big picture. So those few people in this country that do look at the big picture have fear of our st stability and have it an intense state. And I just really, you know, really honor Senator Cory Booker for his work to come out and as somebody looking at that very big spec sec sector, not just ag, but you know, food and housing and the inner city environments and everything else that he's sitting on, he's seeing the big picture and thinking long term. Like we got to think beyond this, you know, short term moving in the deck chairs and we got to get big. So while it's easy to just say that this is special interest, I think it's actually bigger than that. It's special interest being supported by an entire economy, which is us. We are all. We have all fundamentally cooperatively built a $17 trillion you know, economic machine due to our own disconnect from nature, our own lack of sense of variety of independence or capacity to provide for ourselves. So we've all become extractive consumers. And for that, we see the behavior of kind of this abusive misinformation acts and everything else going on. Can I, uh, I add? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Good. Um, I just wanted to add also, like, I think that a lot of people feel really, really um, scared and frustrated when they hear all this information. And I'm sure like I wasn't alone in that. And it's really overwhelming. And so what can you specifically do, like people that are watching right now, like you probably are feeling like you can't go and change policy as much as you would like to right now. And what I really can recommend is you would be really shocked at how much your voice matters locally you start talking to your friends and to your family. And I can tell you it's really uncomfortable because you might become the crazy pesticide lady like I am. However, it's absolutely critical to change people's perceptions. And so when they see this misinformation coming in, they'll think, well, you know what I heard, I heard that, that you know someone I trusted said that. And just don't be intimidated by that. And I think that little by little, we can make change on a local level on that front. What about either you or Zach or Kella Rose, if you want to, um, or Matt, want to address the White House uh, Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health? So you, Zach, you talked about the big picture, really understanding the big picture um, and needing to look at that. This is scheduled for September. I believe this is only the second time, really, we've had this. Um, the White House has held this sort of event in 50 years. Is this, is this for real? Are we going to see some real policy moves perhaps um, advanced here and discussed here? 
I think we have an opportunity to do that. And the exciting thing about White House councils is they there is a forced mechanism for listening in these White House councils. And so Kelly and myself and many others have been doing these dinners around the country uh, that mobilize different stakeholders throughout you know, communities around the country that are in specific voting areas to help bring attention to those respective local governance structures of these issues. And right now we see a huge groundswell of awareness of uh, the importance of an improvement in fundamental health of humans and the pandemic has really revealed our extreme vulnerability in food supply. And so we've all seen grocery store shelves go empty. We've all seen you know, uh, prices skyrocketing uh, um, in many places. You're seeing cans of beans for three, four dollars for a, a small can of beans that used to go for 59 cents. So you see these rapid exponential increases in cost to the consumer. All of that's trickling back on never have we had more awareness that we need a radical change in our global macro economics of farming and you know a, a return to food sovereignty, a return, a return to food independence. And fortunately, I, and we're seeing stakeholders far beyond government starting to get involved in this. And so with Biome Capital, which is a, you know, a fund that we're working on to help partner with farmers to own their land again, so the leasing land, we see stakeholders that used to be thought as the bogeyman in this food industry sitting down at the table. And uh, Matt Nicoletti and, and many of us uh, have been around tables now of stakeholders, you know, big, big farmers, food processors, and, you know, CPG, consumer process good, packaged good industries are bringing their executive leaderships to these tables and sitting down together to cooperatively imagine how we can start to do a stepwise process into a future without chemicals. And so uh, I think, Matt, why don't you jump in for a minute, just the sea change you're seeing around those farmers, processors, and other stakeholders in the ingredient supply chain uh, that, you know, not only do we have to, we don't have to rely necessarily on government change. We can, uh, we can become a voice box to government that not only do consumers want to change, but all the stakeholders want to change. Sure thing. And, and it'd be hard to ignore the fact that it is a sea change that is coming from a little bit of consumer and regulatory pressure. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Like, these are business people at the end of the day, and they're being opportunistic. It's a sea of change and, you know, the prominence of things like ESG, right? Um, the, 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 the amazing thing about, you know, the regenerative paradigm or mode of production, you know, the thing, again, that sort of won me over and that I think are winning over a lot of these farmers is that, you're not paying to clean up after yourself. You know, you're not paying to clean up your act. You're you're actually getting rewarded without any sort of preferential market treatment. Or you know, and yes, that's a benefit. Hopefully, you know, these premium markets may be developed for you know marketing foods with regenerative characteristics or branding around it. Um, but the amazing thing about it is that it stands up on its own two legs, right? And so from you know, from our perspective, again, we're, we're introducing just simple approachable tools. Sometimes it's simple as just replacing a high salt fertilizer with one that's low salt. But, you know, what's been amazing, Zach, and I think you alluded to some of the conversations that, you know, we've had uh, in partnership with the Farmers Footprint folks around some of these, some of the largest vertically integrated grower processors of specialty crops in the world. You know, at least sitting around and having a conversation, giving, get, paying, you know, credence to this, to the prominence of, uh, the, the, the calls, uh, towards, you know, building ESG into their, into their businesses, you know, and, 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 and taking this, this, this movement seriously. So, um, I've been incredibly encouraged by the curiosity that exists amongst these folks, you know, the folks that are more vertically integrated, that have a processing component that are selling to, you know, brands and things like that. Often they're feeling the pressure a little bit more. They have more of that direct insight because they're starting to get, ask these questions, you know, what is your ESG narrative? And, and the cool thing is it's, it's, it's coming from the bottom and you're, you're pushing from the bottom up and you're pulling from the top, you know, the pulling from the top, meaning the, the consumers are asking for it, the brands are asking for it. But, you know, speaking from my perspective, you know, in our business, we're, we're selling innovative crop inputs and soil amendments, right, that are more biologically friendly. It's a pretty competitive space. When we first started, I was like, wow, we're going to be the only ones doing this. It's pretty cool. But actually there's an immense amount of innovation taking place. Um, you know, some of it is missing the mark as things tend to be when there are new market entrants, new movements. It's difficult to, to commercialize these things, difficult to convince farmers. But I, but I, but I am convinced because I've seen 
the efficacy of these modes of production, these biologically friendly products outperform those um, that represent the chemical status quo. I mean, all it, it's innovation at the end of the day, you know, and there's a confluence of traditional wisdom that I think uh, farmers truly appreciate that's approachable to them. But then you bring in the innovative component, the innovative testing methodologies, the SAP analysis, the, you know, Haney soil tests, the nitric acid tests, things that really kind of empirically validate the benefits of what we're doing. So yeah, um, I tend to be optimistic because of the, um, you know, the warm reception that we've received from the marketplace. We have a bit of an uh, advantage being, like I said, you know, we're into the fabric of the uh, industry out here. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's sort of change that's coming from within, but it, it is absolutely coming from without as well. You know, we're getting pulled in this direction due to changing consumer preferences. So to bring the conversation, um, thank you for that, Matt, to bring the conversation back to glyphosate just for a minute and, and farmers and the farmers that I've talked to who are regular uses of glyphosate, you know, a lot of them, they loved it, um, you know, through the 90s. They loved it when they got Roundup Ready crops. They loved it in the 2000s. They started loving it less when weeds started developing re resistance and they started having problems. Um, but if they've been using it and they've incorporated it into their system, you know, they're very loath to let go of it. And I'm wondering what you're hearing from farmers and what do you say when to this, this line we hear all the time, you know, we need, we need it to feed the world. We need these pesticides. We need glyphosate to feed the world. What's, what's the answer to that? You know, that's, that, 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 that's a tough one for me in particular, you know, as when it particularly pertains to glyphosate, you know, because we, like I said, focus more on the fertility side of things. That's our direct lens point of influence. What I can tell you though, the good news is market conditions, inflationary environment that we're experiencing is actually driving farmers to be more open-minded to change. I mean, glyphosate, I think has rallied three X in price over the last you know, 18 months or so. Um, and that is a pain point they're finally now experiencing. Like why they like it is because it's a cheap and effective and easy to use tool, right? Um, and, it, and it goes back to, you know, what Zach mentioned, you know, farmers believe was the ideal environment, a sterile environment, you know, the way we think of the soil, kill everything that's competing with the plant, right? And then just give the cheapest sources, distill out the, you know, you can count it on four hands, how many nutrients, a plant would need and we're going to use the cheapest chemical sources of that and we're going to just plug that into the system. Um, so I would say that, you know, the good news is there are immediate rewards for at least dramatically reducing your consumption of glyphosate through adopting, you know, innovative tools, things like you know, uh, combining a regenerative practice like greater ground co like ground cover with an innovation like a weed seek or something that's using way less glyphosate by targeting, you know, using AI to target the delivery of the herbicide. And granted, I know we're still using uh, glyphosate in, in that scenario, but it's reducing its consumption by 70, 80% and the farmer's getting rewarded for that, right? You know, so we always try and steer them in the direction of something that really creates a return on investment in the short term. If we're going to guide them in any particular direction towards, you know, eliminating the use of something, it's always, it's always a step in that direction. Right. All right. Well, we are running out of time, Jesse, back to you for um, the concluding remarks. Thank you so much, everyone. I just want to give a huge thank you to everyone who has spent time with us. This conversation was invaluable. Um, to every one of our panelists, Senator Booker, Dr. Zach Bush, Calla Rose, Kelly, Matt, Carey, you brought this to life in such a new way. I know that I'm incredibly inspired and I was taking a million notes on all the various ways that we have to engage. And that's part of this process is getting multiple perspectives understanding the different complexities around it. And perhaps like Kelly had shared, you'd be shocked at how much your voice matters and where you might have an opportunity to play in the solution in this wider conversation. So one of those ways we do have a petition that if it resonates with you, that we are going to submit alongside 
the legislative suggestions for that White House conference that was mentioned during this session, and also um, stay connected, get engaged, and stay connected with Farmers Footprints. You'll see our website right here on the slide, but don't, don't worry if you signed up for this webinar, you will be getting the summary of this webinar, you'll be getting key takeaways, and we'll uh, share all different ways that you can connect with any of the thought leaders that you heard here today. So again, we just thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here with us today and stay connected, stay engaged and stay hopeful. Um, and I'll leave us with Cory Booker's um, words that he said that really anything is possible. And I truly believe that. And we'll be hosting more of these conversations and we hope you'll stay along for the ride with us. But thank you everyone for being with us here today.